Um, hello everyone. Before we start our comments and a little bit of our presentation, we have a little exercise for everyone. Um, for that, please briefly go inside of you and reflect um, just for a very brief moment and then get up um, on how much you think your country in, their, in its energy mix is still depending on coal. And once you have set on something, we want you to line up here the country with, which is at, uh, like has the least amount of coal in their energy mix here and the country with the biggest amount of coal in the energy mix over there. Um, please do that really quickly. No one is allowed to Google. That's really important. Otherwise, it's not fun. So everyone up now, line up. Hmm? In the energy, so relative term, not, not in the amount. I don't know. Twenty seconds. Silence, please. So. Okay, great. That works. So. <laughs> um. So let's check who was right. As I see, Hawking is perfectly placed with the zero use of coal and a mix. That term, why? Yeah, maybe just say it. Okay, zero why, zero. Argentina, I think you have no data on mine. <laughs> no data. <laughs> okay. yeah. Over there. So, <laughs> Costa Rica, El Salvador, Libya, Nigeria. Yeah. So, with a zero use of coal, here we have Costa Rica, El Salvador, Libya, Nigeria, Tunisia, and Uruguay. Who was. One percent Mauritania and Egypt. Um, two percent Argentina. Nice team, guys. So we have um, who's that? It's three percent France, Mexico, and Canada. Four percent Italy and Belgium. Five percent UK is just for people who will uh, look at us online from the uk hi guys um brazil with i might i don't really see i think it was something like six percent so austria austria eight percent ireland nine percent it's for Cleo, um, Russia and Finland, 11%, almost there. Uh, the United States with the 12% of um, coal and energy mix, 
Germany and Pakistan together, 17%. Are you together, guys? Almost, yeah. Um, North Macedonia, where is... <laughs> we will skip this part. A world in, in general, 27% of uh, coal and energy mix. So Australia, it's also for people out there online. I hope there are some Australians there. Uh, Czech Republic and Montenegro. Um, 34%. Philippines, 42. <laughs> Bosnia, 52% dependency on coal. Bosnia and Herzegovina. China, 55. <laughs> the hugest consumer of coal in the world. And what else we have? India, 57%. And South Africa, 71% of coal. Coal in the mix. Yes, it's a percentage. Thank you, guys. Inside, sure, sure. Thank you, guys. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So now we can start. Mm -hmm. So now back to presentation. Hope now you are all awake and ready to listen to us. So. Uh, yeah. um, we thought we'd just really quickly start with some definitions. Um, so this is from a paper by Klushina and Mayumi. Um, just in terms of how do we define energy, uh, they say we don't know what energy is, but we know how to calculate it. We know what the, that the formulas work, but not in the mechanisms or reasons for this. So this is just, a, I guess, a pointer of like general discussions of what is energy. Um, but the rough definitions we're going to use is energy is the capacity to do work and work as motion against an opposing force. So we can pretty much skip this. This is what we just heard um, in the lecture. Um, we are constantly talking about an energy tr transition, but we're actually having is an energy addition, um, meaning in the last 200 years, we access different and additional sources of energy and created a different energy mix. Nevertheless, we're still relying on a lot of the energy sources we used 200, 150 years ago. Um, all in all, we just had a huge expansion of the energy usage um, coming from an organic economy to a mineral economy or a fossil capitalism, um, where it was depending mostly on human and animal power. Now it's entirely depending on coal and oil power. Um, so what we actually need to look at is also what we just heard, the supply chain of energy. Um, so it's not just always the one energy source we see. It, as we had the examples of oil and barrels or coal and timber, um, there's also a mix in how we are actually accessing uh, different energy sources. And what we also just heard, but to make it a bit more, I don't know, visible, um, the boom period of coal, even though everyone in like the environmentalist studies is saying, oh, we're getting out of coal. That's absolutely not the case. The boom period of coal is happening right now with China uh, burning more coal every year than France has burned in its entire history. That's why we had China in the very back. Um, so yeah, uh, we have kind of expanded the uh, range of materials we use and also um, the quantity um, of energy we use. Thank you. Um, if we now step a bit outside of the economic sphere and look into the into the physical sphere um, and look at the laws of thermodynamics um, in order to link the energy to the climate part is the first and the second law of th thermodynamics. I will not go into detail in that also because I'm not the expert. Um, but we can what we can take out of that is that we gain a lot of energy for our economy out of our environment, which we then use, uh, which 
uh, results in a loss of energy for the environment, which we then used in our system and then again lose to the environment because we cannot access it anymore. Um, also having in mind that heat always flows from the hotter to the colder body uh, in terms of energy using in the bigger picture means with using the energy we have available uh, or we make available for us, we're heating up our planet because we are making it unavailable again. So if we compare that, for, um, for example, with heating up water, we heat up water with the energy we have, and then obviously the water gets warm. But as soon as the heat from the water goes to the environment via steam or just the heat itself, we lose the availability of the energy again because we can't do anything with it anymore. So that means for us as humans, we have a growth narrative um, above everything. We have economic efficiency as a core principle, uh, and we have increasing access to different energy sources over time. Um, also, we have an increasing demand for energy and very little moral limits um, and a generational responsibility. This also gives us the climate crisis. So we're literally burning ourselves um, with too many resources that we use without having any thought about what that actually does. And we also have a very unequal hegemonic society structure, meaning thank you, um, that we're wasting energy because there has always been more than enough and will be. We know by now that we will not run out of coal or oil, but before that happens, we'll burn. Um, <laughs> and we're still wasting energy, a lot of it, um, always in the cheapest way. This can be seen right now in the whole Russian-Ukraine um, conflict or war, um, where Russian gas, which was the cheapest option for mainland Europe, is now not available anymore. So we go to the next cheapest one, which is now at the moment liquid gas imported from other countries. Um, also, we have to keep in mind that renewables use a lot of energy um, and a lot of resources. So again, the supply chain kicks in. And the only main incentive we basically have to stop is the climate crisis. And we all know by now very well that this is not an incentive enough because it's no monetary incentive because natural resources are still seen as something for free. Um, and also the current generation in that hegemonic power positions, they don't need to worry because they won't be there anymore when everything gets really bad. Um, so now to bring the discussion a little bit on, um, in terms of when we're thinking about the material resources that we're using, perhaps we should be thinking in terms of social metabolism and metabolic regimes. So this is from a paper by Kraussmann et al. And they uh, distinguish metabolic regimes by their type of energy system and the energy density for which this allows. So they distinguish three different types of metabolic regimes. The hunter-gatherer societies, where, which mainly relied on, or relied on uncontrolled solar energy systems. So that means that uh, the use of biomass produced by um, the earth and ecosystems that were not controlled by human populations. Um, then we have agrarian societies that use controlled solar energy systems. So that's where humans started to interfere or um, I guess shape ecosystems for their own use um, and led to the, like controlled use of solar energy systems. And then we have industrial societies that have um, as has been explained previously, plural energy systems is how we could think of um, our metabolic regime. So here's just um, a table from this paper that I think is really nice at showing um, some of the scales of the shifts between hunter-gatherer, agrarian and industrial regimes. Um, so for example, we can see that energy use in terms of domestic energy consumption per capita for hunter-gatherers was 10 to 20 gigajoules per capita per year. Um, moving to an agrarian society, that moves to 40 to 70 gigajoules um, per year. And then industrial societies, we see this huge explosion of 150 to 400 gigajoules um, per capita per year. So then we can also see the factor increase between um, moving from agrarian to industrial societies is a scale uh, increase between three to five times. Um, we can also see the material use is massively increasing again from agrarian societies to industrial societies. It's an increase of three to five times the factor, um, which allows for uh, massively increased population densities. Um, 
and also the buildup of material stocks. So we can see that the increase of material stocks from agrarian regimes to industrial regimes increases by a factor of 10 to 100. So overall, I think we, this is really clearly a, um, a demonstration of the massive expansion of our metab social metabolism um, and just the overall massive increase in the energy and material that we're using um, in our current social provisioning system. And again, here's just a little bit more uh, data. So we can see that this is between 1870 and 2005. The green uh, indicates biomass use. Uh, blue is fossil energy carriers. Um, the Maybe you can see quite clearly the purple there is ores and the gray is non-metallic minerals. So you can see the, I guess, the myth of energy transition, or if we were to talk in shift terms of shift of social metabolism, I guess the myth that we've moved away from biomass is really clearly shown to be false because we can see that the biomass is at least stable, if not increasing since uh, around 1950s or so. Um, and overall, this gives a really nice picture of just the huge increase in the overall uh, social metabolism that we have at the moment. The non-metallic minerals. Finally, if you look in Britain, it seems quite stable. The ratio between fossil fuels and energy and biomass, mm -hmm. it's remarkably stable. French, no? I mean, it's... Uh... Um, the only thing that seems to have expanded for the case of Britain is the grey, you know? It's quite, I, mean, I guess also this time period is like not so long. So we're looking kind of at the end of the yeah. shift of industrial. Um, and then also, can we think in terms of post industrial metabolic regime? Um, so these authors, I guess, don't have so much optimism here. And they talk about the post-industrial economy is still building on the industrial regime rather than replacing it. Moreover, instead of finding substitutes for its material and energy intensive metabolic profile, it adds to this profile. Infrastructures, mobilities and mass production and consumption are not vanishing in the service economy. Um, I think another way of thinking about this is also to look at the research of Andres Malm, um, who has been looking at kind of the origins of this shift from water uh water powered cotton industries in britain to uh fossil um fossil fuel or coal powered um cotton industries and i think what he's really pointing to is the fact that um during the time of this shift water power was still abundant was still produced better quality cotton and was still cheaper so he poses the question of why then was the did this shift occur and he sees it in terms of um fundamentally premised in social relations of capitalism so he explains the fossil economy as an economy characterized by self-sustaining growth predicated on growing consumptions of fossil fuels and therefore generating sustained growth of emissions of carbon dioxide and he says that fossil fuels should by their very definition, be understood as a social relation. Um, he says a systemic large-scale extraction of fossil fuels necessitates the com commodity product production and waged or forced labors of components of their very existence. So we talked about how we bring fossil fuels into existence through our uh, social provisioning system of capitalism. Um, and he talks about um, the Fossil fuels go hand in hand with the capitalist social relations in terms of the ability to exploit labor, the untying of capital from space and um, and steam as being the capitalist solution to the reduction of the working day and fossil fuel as the antagonist to human power and I guess labor power. Um, so we talked about um, fossil fuels as being everything that labor is not, all of its virtues are the negations of the working class vices. So he really understands the importance of the social context in which this occurred and capitalism as being a driving factor in the need to control labor power through fossil fuels. So um, like we already heard today, the availability of uh, new energy resources um, and their efficient exploitation historically have been um, followed by greater overall consumption, consumption of energy. Um, at first uh, look, it could sound a little bit counterintuitive. However, this paradox has been known for quite a while. 
Um, in uh, 19th century, uh, William Jevons wrote a book uh, called uh, The Coal Question, where he observed that the use of coal shot up uh, right after the improvement of the steam engines. Uh, Jevons noted also that while technological uh, development significantly increased the efficiency of uh, steam engines, um, which actually enables them to generate more uh, work um, uh, with less coal, the um, coal consumption didn't uh, decrease. This uh, paradox is one of the uh, biggest problems of the uh, env environmentalist economics nowadays and um, is now widely known as uh, the phenomenon of um, rebound effect. Uh, this effect may be a part of explanation why uh, there is no energy transition and probably it will never happen. Um, this coal and steam engine example is one of the extreme examples. However, we can uh, see these rebound effects um, um, being observed in connection to many uh, policies that are uh, intend to curb the uh, resource use. Uh, so the rebound effects um, might have uh, different uh, influences on uh, social economic development of societies. It could be both positive and negative. From the positive side, we can uh, uh, say that uh, rebound effect um, effects could influence um, uh, sustainable development goals uh, number one, which is no poverty, three good health and well-being, and eight decent work and economic growth. However, it could counteract are all the attempts uh, of uh, reaching um, SDG 7, which is uh, affordable and clean energy, and uh, number 13, which is climate action. Um, in this scenario, uh, there should be additional policies implied to mitigate the effect of um, rebound effects. Um, and um, for example, uh, uh, the policies and measures which could be used uh, societal and behavioral, for example, information and awareness, uh, which are um, intended to change uh, social norms, uh, regulatory instruments and economic instruments such as taxation, uh, taxation and pricing. And um, as an example, we can uh, say a cap and trade um, measure. Um, very interesting. Um, thing as well. Mm -hmm. um, some SDGs are um, comparable to the European uh, Union Green Deal. As you all know, the European um, Union Green Deal is a set of policies with the goal to uh, transition the European Union um, to a sustainable uh, economy. And these policies cover, among other many things, uh, clean energy and sustainable energy. Uh, in the Council communication of the Green Deal in 2019, it says, uh, quote, energy efficiency must be prioritized. A power sector must be developed that is based largely on renewable sources, complemented by the rapid phasing out of coal and decarbonizing gas. Um, which, so far, so good, right? Um, at the same time, uh, the uh, continuing of quoting, uh, at the same time, the European Union's energy supply needs to be secure and affordable for consumers and businesses. And um, what we can say that uh, practically this seems to give up any intentions to somehow address in the rebound facts by the uh, price and measures. And um, among the main criticism of um, uh, the deal is that it relies on uh, decoupling um, of uh, growth from you know, emissions and this possibility of such decoupling, um, I don't think it will, <laughs> we will see it in the near future and it's not uh, possible at least in a short time frame. Um, this all leads to the question um, whether the growth uh, paradigm um, and um, uh, livable, livable planet are um, at all um, compatible. Thank you very much. So, and the questions that uh, we have uh, for you, Jean-Baptiste, uh, what more of an incentive can uh, there be other than the climate crisis to actually have an energy transition? Uh, should I follow with all questions? Uh, do you see any dynamics in our social metabolic regime that might be causes of optimism? Or uh, if energy transitions are out of the question, what are we left with? Um, 
is a true transition possible under a growth paradigm and uh, who needs to change their behavior, whether it should be individuals, enterprises or national states? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't have answers to all these questions. Uh, Maybe the, the other incentive, a lot of literature on the um, ah, oh yeah, on the co on the co benefits uh, of uh, climate uh, of. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Ah. <laughs> regarding the first question there's a lot of literature on the on the beneficial aspect of uh, reducing emissions especially in terms of health for uh, of course in cities uh, for for traffic uh the food it is well known that we should massively decrease our consumption of meat and it's good for health and good for the climate so there are other incentives than just the climate that going to change our behavior um do you see any dynamics in our socio-metric region? Okay, uh, I think we should be careful. At one point, you mentioned the fact that renewables do consume uh, energies and fossil fuels. You need, and fossil fuel, you need coal, for instance, to produce uh, silicium, pure silicium. You need a lot of energy, and it is based on coal. It's kind of like allergies, like steam fish. Um, but, sorry? You can't hear me? Okay, but in fact, when you look at the figures, I mean, what is really uh, CO2 emitting, it's more like the production of electric cars, much more than the solar panels or the, or the wind turbines. So when we talk about criticizing the kind of green technologies, we should be careful. I mean, there, there we must differentiate between the production of electricity, which, I mean, we will need a lot of electricity in the future in, for any, for, for hospitals, for schools, for, uh, for many other good reasons. I mean, the question is, what we will do with this electricity. If it is to power 1.7 billion uh, uh, cars, just as we have now, of course, uh, we know that uh, electric cars are not the solution. I mean, because 70% of an electric car in mass is steel, and steel is going to be extremely difficult to decarbonize, at least in 30 years' time. Okay. Uh, if you've got uh, heavy electric cars, uh, you have to rebuild the road all the time. Recently, there was a PhD thesis uh, defended by Nilo Magales, and he shows how the, I mean, the, the key aspect is the weight of vehicles for the maintenance of roads. And I mean, the maintenance of roads, it can be like one, one third of the consumption of cement in a, in a country, even in France, where you don't build so many new roads, there's still a lot of cement going into roads because of the constant maintenance of roads. So that's why electric cars is, of course, uh, a half solution and therefore not a solution to, to, to climate change. So, I mean, that's one of the cause of optimism is still that, uh, yes, solar panels are getting, uh, you know, they're efficient, uh, wind, wind energy, there is uh, important progress. So that's, you know, that's good news in a way, but it really depends on what we decide to do on the, on the, on the electricity provided with this uh, cleaner, not clean, but cleaner, Technology. Um, if you have yes. Uh, so, um, do you think that the energy transition is possible in the future? Even if it's not in the past, is that possible? Is there one more new one? Not, not in thirty years' time. That I don't buy it. Um, not, frankly, in the long future, I can't tell you because you know many things can happen, and there are technologies we have. But I don't know. But with the technology that we have in thirty years' time, yeah, it's completely illusory. We will not be out of. Uh, Fossil fuels in 2050. Kind of um, and the three last questions, I don't really have answers. And the two last questions, I, probably not. And the last one, and you need to change the view. Everyone, I mean, it's, you should not, because there is very an easy opposition between, you know, uh, uh, individual responsibility would be just a neoliberal discourse, and uh, the true uh, climate activists should focus on uh, the politics, the structure, and so on. Yes, sure, but it goes together. So it needs to be rubbish to oppose uh, the one with another. Um, OK. Yeah. Otherwise, I had two small remarks about your yes. presentation. Your remarks, yes. The first one, you know, when you were um, ordering the countries according to their coal uh, input, uh, there are papers allowing to track the amount of coal going into um, Imports. If you take the case of France, but Britain is the same, basically, uh, France consumes each year through its importation one ton of coal per year. There are 70 million Frenchmen and women, which make 70 million tons of coal. 
which makes France close to its maximum of coal extraction in the, in the 1960s. If you take Britain, it's even a bit more uh, because there are larger importations. So, I mean, really uh, rich countries because they're rich. They've got a large uh, trade balance, large uh, trade, international trade, and therefore they import a lot of goods, and the goods are one third they are produced with coal. I mean, we call the one third, I mean, uh, one third of the energy mix is with, with coal. That's why we should be careful, you know, by the, the fact of imputing CO2 emissions to one particular country, is actually tricky. Look at Switzerland. Switzerland, they have never used so much coal. The, the last coal mines was closed in 1945. So Switzerland looks fantastic on statistics. It's extremely wealthy and it's and it's quite I mean, not so much CO2. Okay, fantastic. But uh, Switzerland is the leader in the in commodity trading. And uh, Glencore, Trafigura, they possess mines, coal mines, and they are extracting each year 500 million tons of coal. Okay. And then, uh, like there are 100 companies dealing with uh, coal trading in, in Switzerland, and it is another 500 million tons of coal. So, part of the prosperity of Switzerland is based on a global economy which still is powered in some part with coal. That's why, you know, if you start to look at imputation on new benefits from the burning of coal, well, Swiss would be very well placed uh, for benefiting on, on the coal which is burned. So that's why I think we should be careful, you know, in ordering. Uh, it might be that in France, per capita, we still, you know, burn much more coal than uh, many people in India, for instance. You know? Even if there is very little coal in the electricity mix of France and to nuclear energy. Okay. okay? And, the, and the last remark was about, um, I think, a lot of uh, new history of energy. Uh, there is the book by Mount, but there is another book by um, Tim Mitchell, Carbon Democracy, it's the same kind of narrative. Basically, uh, fossil fuels and the climate crisis are kind of capitalist plot. I don't buy this argument. I think it's, it's true that capitalism is crops in the, the problem. Indeed, it is clearly linked with that. But there are many problems with the argument as well. Uh, for instance, Britain, 1830s, most of the coal is not used in steam engine. Most of the coal is used for heat. One half is for domestic heat, so it's for the Brits to be warm in their house, right? So, I mean, it's, um, and, and, and the other thing is, I mean, there, there is a, a will to show that, you know, it's not a question of uh, resource, it's not a question of exhaustion. There was still a lot of water power, which is true, but it's not true for the forest. Britain was mainly uh, devoid of uh, forests in, in the 1830s. And to produce steel in the extent of what was being done in the 1830s, coal was already indispensable. Okay. I think, I mean, and the, and the last thing is, it's a narrative of a shift. There was water and then there is coal. No, actually water is still expanding in Britain in the, after 1830, of course. And, and, and for instance, in, in the US, by far the main uh, industrial energy still in the 1860s, 1870s is water power. And the US is just as much capitalistic as, you know, there, there are plenty of problems when you, when you uh, focus on one picture, you see what I mean? Or, Point that Mal was trying to make there is still useful for yeah. is, is the point of how I think he shows that maybe in the course of 10 years water went from being by far the predominant mm. um powering source of, of wool mills to within 10 years being very much on the decrease and not being not being exploited more or not more new projects not being as numerous as the as, as the coal stuff mm -hmm. I, I think like it does show an important um an important important shift in the social in the social relations as well because i think when you're saying this most of the in the 1830s most of the coal was used to heat homes i think his point is precisely that if we would have continued only using coal to heat our homes then we wouldn't have had this huge increase in the ex like extraction of of coal that occurred with the capitalist production system. I think he argues that it wouldn't be as exponential or as massive a shift as that. And I, I think it's, it gives far too much importance to what is happening in Britain in 1830, okay. which is not very important. Yeah. When you look at the history of uh, resources all over the world, I mean, one a fantastic book to understand industrialization differently is Jim Bennett, Reclamation the Earth. Basically, one of the massive shifts and transformation in the 19th century is, is from Australia, so we can say that. The fact that uh, Brits start proliferating like rabbits, he says that uh, like this. I mean, there is a fantastic demographic expansion of Britain and British descendants. Yeah. Sorry? Ah, okay. So basically, 
in the 19th century, one of the major transformation of the world system is the fact that people of British uh, ascent, they, they are much more numerous than uh, at the end of the 19th century than they were at the beginning of the 19th century. It's not true for other countries. And he said, okay, we could talk about coal, but it's not fueled by coal, this transformation. It's a non-industrial revolution. It is a massive production of, uh, of agricultural uh, uh, stuff in New Zealand, in Australia, in the US. And it was not really linked with coal. I mean, it's not coal is not central in the story. So really we have to, to decentral, I mean, we, coal is not so important for the 19th century. It's important for the 20th century, uh, a, a, a nice figure. If you take the total extraction of coal since 1800, 96% has been extracted in the 20th century, 4% in the 19th century, okay? If you take the whole extraction of coal from the 1800 to 2000, 86% has been extracted out of Europe. So, I mean, really you have to, to, to see that uh, perhaps we should decenter ourselves from the standard narrative of the industrial revolution. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, very interesting topic. I have two quick questions. One, uh, when you're talking about the predictions that were made by the atomic scientists in the 70s and 50s, yep. Um, and how bad they went, the predictions. Uh, what's the role of the unpopularity of nuclear energy in those predictions, uh, in your opinion? And also in the most, let's say, most recent uh, history of the transition, what are the prognostics in, in relation to other types of uh, clean energy, also in relation to, for example, the use of rare earths for solar energy and so on? Are also those problems for for the future transition? What are the prognosis in terms of that? Okay. Well, I answer immediately because otherwise I will forget. Uh, basically, for the second question, I'm not an expert, at, but I've seen some reports. Uh, the question is not so much the reserves of uh, materials than the pollution of producing these materials. This, this is really the key the key problem. Uh, but I mean, there are a lot of rare earths, but um, it's not rare. It's just that we don't want to mass produce them uh, everywhere. And that's why it's so concentrated in few countries for the moment. But if we really want to, we can have a lot of lithium, a lot of, uh, or, or neodium, or these kind of stranger metals that are in permanent uh, magnets. I mean, that's the, the key effect. Uh, so it's not a Mactusian question, it's more a question of pollution, of emissions, of, uh, of, of water, of uh, this kind of problem. And for the first question, I don't know if it's really the scare of nuclear energy, which has prevented the expansion of nuclear energy. I'm not sure. I don't think this is the case. Because, I mean, one, what, what, for instance, what, what, in the 19, after 1978, and especially after 2000, there is a big transformation of the energy mix, of course, the growth of coal in China. And not only China, by the way, uh, for, the for the people in China, China is not exceptional, just big, but it's not exceptional. Between, it has been multiplied by 10 between 1980 and 2000, or 2010, I can't remember, the amount of coal extracted in China, but uh, Indonesia, it has been multiplied by 70. Uh, if you take the uh, South Korea by seven, you know, there are plenty of other countries where there is similar increase. India, of course, is another example. So, I mean, uh, the fact that China has increased suddenly its consumption of coal is kind of you know, normal. It's not that uh, strange phenomenon. Uh, when you put that into the, what's happening on the energy mix of, uh, of, uh, in Asia, okay? Uh, so is it really the scare of the atom which made that uh, China relied on coal and not nuclear energy? No, it's a question of money much cheaper to produce electricity uh, with coal than with nuclear energy. So I don't think this is really the key issue, not the scale, the, the, the afraid that people uh, were afraid of uh, nuclear energy. Yes. Yes. Ah, okay, yeah. Guys, it's so tough. I tried to talk very loud because the music is being talked about. Really? The room's too crowded. Yeah. It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't work on the phone. Okay. No. Okay, um, thank you. I have a question for, I want to provide a context. My name is Elizabeth from Nigeria. I would like to provide context for the first question about 
building incentives around the energy transition beyond the climate crisis. So in Nigeria, there's going to be a presidential election uh, next year. Mm -hmm. But one of the leading candidates uh, mentioned a few weeks ago that climate change is a thing of the West. Mm -hmm. It's a thing of the West, it's an issue of the West. So, I mean, if the people who are going to lead a country that's uh, con uh, producing coal and also consuming a lot of Chinese products, or chi the Chinese market, where a dominant um, con consumer of the Chinese market. So if leading, leading uh, the, a presidential candidate is going to say that and would likely either rig the election or win it, how do you introduce incentives into that kind of social setting to ensure that we we achieve something like this if it exists, if there's a, an energy transition, like moving from coal to more renewable sources of energy. Honestly, I'm far too ignorant of the Nigerian context and political context to give any interesting answer to your question. Sorry, I mean, I would like to learn actually. Yeah, no, from it, the, it may not, it doesn't Nigeria necessarily have to be specific to mine, but I mean, I feel that a lot of discourses around the energy transition just push away the social side of things. And then we just talk about the climate change. We talk about the forms of energy, but we're not talking about what we need to get done. I've heard these things a lot, but okay, what's the next step? Or maybe are there studies that are now going into indigenous communities to um, see how to introduce incentives and change? We need to change something from somewhere. And that's why I'm asking a question like this, but thanks. I mean, the, why we are talking so much about energy and so on, it's because it's two thirds of the emissions. That's why, I mean, I think it makes sense to talk about energy systems. And I agree, I mean, that it's a limited, uh, it's not all the problem, it's a really large part of the problem. Um, but no, frankly, I can't really answer to your question about what kind of incentive you should, basically what would be the proper discourse in Nigeria to to mobilize people around the solar panels and wind and, and wind energy or reduction of uh, of uh, oil production, but I guess there is still enormous need of uh, investments in infrastructures, which are dependent on fossil fuels. So I mean I, the, the situation is very different from uh, a low income country to a rich country. Where my discourse is really uh, for for people in rich countries that they need to understand that. Basically, we have already exhausted by far the carbon credits, you know, the supposed uh, tons of carbon that we should have emit not to, to overpass two degrees Celsius. So not talking about the growth, it's really selfish. That's, uh, that's really the point. Uh, and, but, but for, for different settings, I think all, all I'm saying is completely out of place. I think. Um, I also had a question around the, the social side of the energy transition. Is, can any, everyone hear me right now? Okay, um, so about that, like we see that the energy transition in any case will happen somehow, like not maybe now, but in the future. And I would like to ask a question also related uh, the energy transition with another concept, which is the just transition. And I would like to see what is your thought about like how we can relate energy transition with a just transition and how can we think about also employment and like the social sides of uh for example the jobs in the coal sector that are gonna yeah disappear yeah. and be need to be transitioned and if you have any thought about that because i feel like it's still also an important point why we don't have an energy transition and if you can have like okay yeah, um, that, it would be nice. in the way the jobs in the coal sector have already disappeared I mean, because when you look at the numbers of people employed, it has decreased tremendously in the 60s before we start we stopped using coal in Europe because it were, it were machines that were extracting coal in the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, there were very few people in, in coal mines. In Germany, I don't know how many coal miners there are, but they are not very numerous. We are, about, we are talking about tens of thousands maximum. So it's really, I mean, it's uh, compared to the kind of uh, industrial conversion that we had in the 60s with the closure of huge uh, segments of the industry in Northern France or in industri other industrialized countries. It's not such a big, frankly, it's, it not, the, it's not what is stopping the transition. I don't it's buy that. It's like, um, in, maybe not in France, but in, in Germany or Czech Republic or Poland. Yeah, not that many miners. I mean, the, because, like, but there are still a lot of jobs in the sector, not directly related to mining, but it's still. Well, if you take if you take car manufacturing, yes, you've got a lot of jobs. But I mean, but no, for instance, uh, just the, the the coal mines in Germany, of course, they are open cast mines, they are lignite mines, like lignite, lignite. Uh, they are using huge rotary excavators, 
these uh, rotary excavators they can extract in theory 70 million tons of coal per year it's just as much as all coal mines in france in the 1960s just one machine with five technicians now we are, we are really i think uh, in rich countries coal mines is a uniquely capitalistic process it's not really based on, on human labor so i mean it's and the, and the notion of just transition be careful i think with this idea i got the feeling that i mean the, the world is very unjust structurally and we have to do a transition if we have to do just transition i mean doing a transition is also is already extremely challenging but making sure that if everything is perfectly just it just make it completely impossible i mean just i mean that that really strikes me that you know we have to do a just transition but we have to do justice point out i mean we to be separated i think from the from the question of uh, of the transition i i'm afraid that this idea is actually you know it's just like politicians invoking the the yellow vest for doing nothing you know the, suddenly there is a yellow vest and uh, you you can't do any more effort no the french don't want to get the yellow vest i think it's just you know it's about uh, it's a new excuse for doing nothing because if you want to do just social justice, you've got fiscal policy, you've got public spending, there are plenty of very powerful tools to reduce injustice, you know? Uh, Professor, I have two questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is... Um, um, no, and just, sorry, just one, one on top of that. Many of the injustices come from coal and fossil fuels. Look at, I mean, the suburban area and the fact that uh, uh, supermarkets, for instance, are a perfect way of concentrating income and capital, and is depending on on uh, on. Uh, so, in many ways, transition is just in, uh, in per se, in a way. And I think we are just making a, you know ghosts of things that uh, by uh, anyway. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. Sorry. Uh, yeah, my first question is uh, about the transition towards renewable renewable energy. Um, but renewable energy also, like the production of renewable energy, also has problems like water. Like there's dams which kills like the the like the local biodiversity mm -hmm. and like displaces people. Wind energy is generally remote, so there's like long turbine, like long lines of infrastructure, and they're very loud, which also hurts the uh, local infrastructure. Nuclear has a lot of waste, and uh, lithium-based batteries also have like their own uh, yeah. ecosystem of problems. And um, this transition assumes that uh, energy is going to, um, the amount of energy required is going to increase in the future. And, uh, the, but there's no discussion around reducing dependency on energy for our economies. Mm. Uh, so like, I mean, it feels as though, sure, there'll be a transition away from coal, but it will just introduce us to a host of new problems. Um, so in that, in that sense, like, why why is there no discussion about reducing dependency on energy like even during the war um europe faces a crisis but the only discussion was around how to get access to different kinds of energy not how to reduce uh the energy spending uh my second question is about the just, just transition um there's like historically there's always been this uh, dichotomy of like how important justice is and how important growth is and it always seems as though growth wins out over justice but like i mean there has to be a point where as economists we say that like justice is important so like even if it is like impossible for the transition to happen in a just way then perhaps that's not the direction we ought to choose those are my questions Yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I think the, these questions were more directed to the future. I try to go a little bit back because you're also a historian. Yeah, no. um, I think my two questions, one is related to how the energy regime, so the dominant and primary energy um, is connected to the bargaining power of labor, like how certain, I don't know, how coal or oil has different impacts and what your research has, has showed you on this or whether you've done research. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is how this is connected to currency hierarchy. So you have the dollar now connected to oil, you have the pound being connected to um, coal. And uh, so how hegemonic power is related to the way primary resources are invoiced in certain currencies. Okay. Uh, 
Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm still thinking about the, even the notion of energy transition, because you said that uh, the energy transition will not happen within 30 years. Then my question uh, would be, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean that we will not be able to complete the transition towards like completely, completely renewable energy or that the world as a whole will not be able to reach climate neutrality or um, what what is uh, what is the meaning exactly or um, yeah that's that's one of the things and just very shortly on the just transition I think um, the problem with the current energy transition even the energy crisis is that um, people feel the unjust the unjust um, um, consequences that it has on not only in the coal regions and I think even though the, the, the number of uh, jobs within the industry is very, very small, um, currently like around, I don't know, 0.5% uh, in the Czech Republic, um, it is uh, very important in these localities where the problems occur. So I think it's um, uh, not at least strategic and definitely not uh, just to say, well, it's a minority problem, let's not deal with it. So my, yeah, my question where it probably leads me is whether it is not even more important to stress the justice narrative within the energy transition. And if there, was, there, there were injustices in the past and we see that there are injustices uh, in the current system and we are to be afraid that there will be even more injustices created by the uh, energy transition. Okay, um, I will start with the rhetorical questions. Uh, so there is a, I mean, uh, your point about coal and oil and bargaining power, it was really raised by your recent book, well, not so recent now, but uh, Carbon Democracy, 2013. I was seduced by the thesis at first, and then, because I was, I not worked on that actually, but the more I work on this topic, I realized that the thesis does not hold for some different reasons. First of all, uh, oil does not replace coal. Whereas the, the narrative of Tim Mitchell is based on the idea that there is a shift from coal where there would be a lot of miners to oil where there are few workers and therefore the power of workers decreased with the, with the, coal, with the oil system. The problem is that uh, there is no such transition because when you burn oil, you need a lot of coal. So it's not that the point. Uh, and the other thing is we oil starts to to eat the market of coal in the 1960s almost. In the 1960s, coal is less labor intensive than oil. Because I told you there are very large productivity gains in mind. So in fact, there are far less coal miners in the US in 1955 than there are oil workers. So it's not really the materiality of the thing that which made that coal uh, would be more democratic and oil would be more capitalistic. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. Um, so I, uh, I think it's far too simplistic, far too deterministic. And I would also make you notice that uh, US in the 1960s is far more equalitarian than Europe in the early 1900s, where coal is important and oil is important. Okay? So I mean, it's, it's uh, I think the thesis, when you really start to look at, to look at it, isn't work at all. Um, and for currency, I think to be the same, I think, there are, I mean, I'm not an expert on that, to be honest, uh, so I, I can't really, really answer seriously, but uh, the power of the dollar nowadays, I'm not sure it is really based on oil. I mean, it's based on the, the fact that uh, the, the world trading is based on, I mean, it's true that after 19, 1973, the, all the petrol dollars were recycled in Wall Street and so on. I know the story and the, there is, I haven't read a book on that. Um, but in a way, I mean, very often people studying energy, very quickly they jump on conclusion on society and on economics and which sometimes I find too a bit far-fetched and very quickly it morphs into energy determinism, which I, I don't really buy. Um, for then there, there was a question, I will, yeah, what does it mean we won't have uh, any, uh, I mean, the, 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 this, this notion of carbon neutrality is a trap, as you all know, 
the, this idea of net zero carbon should be uh, the new goal. Because then it allows you to have negative emissions, which is a fantastic trick introduced by the oil uh, industry uh, as soon as the 1980s, saying that, well, we can go on emitting CO2 because we would increase the, uh, the, 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 the carbon uh, sinks. But in fact, we don't know how to do that. So, I mean, this is really, I mean, uh, reaching carbon neutrality, no, it's decarbonizing the. So, I, I would be really careful about this, uh, this idea. Um, then there are, there are still questions about just, I mean, you know, what I wanted to say is energy transition is already utopian. So, a just energy transition is doubly utopian. So, if you want to fight for, for, for equality, yes, of course. But you have to see that saying that, oh, the transition has to be just and perfect. No, no, I think it's just putting even more pressure on the thing which is already extremely difficult to reach. Then, of course, if people are, if you stop uh, all branches of industry, you have to compensate. And but the, I mean, you have to pay for the social system in general. But I think it's, I, I would like to see exactly where does it come from, this idea of just transition as well. You know? And I, I mean, that's why it would be, I, I feel really strange this sudden outburst of uh, justice by people uh, working on this topic, whereas they're, I mean, they, they, they were not really the, the key aspect of people reflecting on energy before. Um, and, and then, I mean, compensating the, the people working in Silesia, in the mines, uh, or in, in Eastern Germany, I mean, it's, it's not out of reach of the economy, of the, of the of German economy. It's really not, I think it's not that which made that Germany does not have an, a quick energy transition. It's not the miners, for true. And the other thing uh, you say at some point it was said that yes we'll probably get out of coal. I'm not convinced actually, because coal is still indispensable for steel, and steel is crucial for for so many things in the world. I will be really I mean I'm dubious by the fact that I mean coal will go out of electricity production probably, but for the rest, not sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 